Okay, so as, as, we get ready to, as we get ready to settle in for a pretty remarkable presentation, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to the vault. For those of you who are used to being over in our normal space, you know that, uh, that this is a little different, and we're happy to have you see this part of Jefferson that you normally would not see. We're also especially pleased to introduce our guest to the part of Jefferson that nobody <laughs> sees, but it's where the coolest stuff is going on. Um, it is my delight to present to you our speaker today. Osagi M. Soje is the senior managing partner of uh, PIPV Capital, but that doesn't even begin to approach the kinds of uh, enterprises that he is engaged in. Uh, today he's going to be talking about intellectual property as global currency, but this is a man who knows how to generate every kind of currency. <laughs> he, he generates intellectual property cur currency, he is incredibly successful as a venture capitalist. We've known each other for a long time. He also generates human capital. Um, and that's probably the thing that I appreciate about him the most, is that he is just one of the most extraordinary people that I know, in part because, you know, there's this sort of orientation that you gotta be kind of be a tough, rough, tumble person to be successful. And he just blows that image out of the water. He's, he is a living demonstration that sometimes the good guys win. <laughs> With that, I introduce to you Osagi Amisoje. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, as usual, Donna has been too kind with her words, um, but I appreciate the introduction. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of uh, faces that I know in the audience, which is good. Um, and so I've been told that I'm supposed to bore you for the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, let's see how far we can go with that. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, something that is two things that are close and dear to my, to my, uh, to my heart. Um, uh, the idea of intellectual property and the idea of uh, making money. Um, and both, uh, I think, are very closely connected. So let's start off. Uh, I've been reading a, a, an author. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have read uh, uh, Yuval Harari's three books. Um, they're very interesting. Good. I actually like them in the order in which you wrote them. <laughs> um, but in his first book, um, which is called Sapiens, uh, he makes uh, one of his fundamental concepts is the idea of shared myths. And he talks about shared myths. Uh, so what are shared myths? Um, um, religion, for instance, is a shared myth. Um, money, currency, is a shared myth. These are myths that we uh, agree in, are important. And because we agree that they're important, we infuse them with, with validity. Um, a nation is a shared myth. There's no such thing. We, we create it. We, we agree that this is America, and because we agree, then it is America. So when we start thinking about intellectual property, that's actually one of the biggest shared myths doesn't exist. We made it up. There's nothing external in nature that says that the Nike swish mark should be protected. Why? It's a check mark. That's what it is. There's nothing in nature that says um, a composition of a particular piece of music should be protected, or that an invention of a particular technology or a drug should be protected. Nothing. We simply made it up. And it's an amazing, amazing shared myth, because that shared myth has created a huge amount of value uh, for society uh, in all forms of value, so monetarily and in terms of human lives. Um, so intellectual property is a legal construct, something we made up. Um, and there are different ways to manifest that concept. Uh, we've got patents and copyrights and trademarks and trade secrets and things of that sort. I presume most people have a working knowledge of each one of those concepts. Uh, but the, the important thing is that there are different types of intellectual property. There are different time frames that you can have exclusivity. All of them, every form of intellectual property, essentially um, uh, gives a government-sanctioned monopoly around that intellectual property for a finite period of time. Um, and that is the nature of intellectual properties. This amazing thing that we made up, this shared myth. Um, and then I talked about intellectual property being the new global currency. So what is currency? Well, that happens to be another shared myth. 
uh, it's interesting, the, some of the earliest forms of currency was actually barley. So, you, so that actually had real value because you could eat it. <laughs> but since then we've evolved um, and we've evolved into different types of currency. But it's nothing real. It's a shared myth. Uh, we went off the gold standard decades ago. This means nothing. This is an illusion. We chose to give it value, so it has value. And in fact, um, most people don't know that only 8% of the cash in circulation is actually physical cash. So when people are making noise about uh, bitcoins and the like, I just laugh. 92% uh, of your currency is already electronic. <laughs> so what are you arguing about? The only difference with bitcoins is that the intermediary is no longer the government, but individuals. That's it. But we've already gone digital. There's only 8% of physical cash um, is, is currency. So another powerful shared myth. So in effect, we're talking about two sh big shared myths. The myth of intellectual property, which we made up and has created value, and the myth of currency, which we equally made up and also uh, people kind of kill and die for it, which is ridiculous, but it's also a shared myth. Um, and I, I, I joke when I talk about it as being a new global currency because it has a very uh, old and ancient history. Uh, so for example, uh, within the UK system, one of the first clear designations of, of patents was something known as the, the Statues of Anne or Statues of Monopoly in 1623 and 1624. So as far back as uh, the, uh, the 1600s, we're already talking about um, this intellectual property being a, a, a platform to create value. It was already tied to the question of um, um, exclusivity and to the question of significant economic value coming out of it. When, when it started, actually, the, the Sergeants of Anne was an, an effort to stop the British sovereigns from doing pretty nasty things. So, if you were a friend of the king or the queen, and uh, particularly if you, if you uh, had lent them money and they owe you money, they would decide that, you know what, I like the way you look. Uh, I'm gonna give you exclusivity to supply salt in the city of Manchester, and no one else could do it. And that's kind of where it started. What is peculiar, and this is important in terms of understanding what we've done with this new global currency, what is pe peculiar about the English um, uh, initial uh, protection of patents, for example, was that they gave protection not just to an inventor, as we currently understand it, as the wonderful things being done here in the vault, but they gave protection to someone who steals technology, provided you brought it into England. <laughs> so think about that for a moment. This was the basis of the, of the British intellectual property system, theft. And most countries that have ended up being industrialized actually have gone through a well-trodden path. They first steal the technology from someone else. In the case of the English, they were stealing it from the Netherlands, from what they call the low countries. Um, then they copy it, like a fabrication uh, facility like this. And in the process of copying, they start having ideas of how to innovate and improve on it. And then eventually they build a strong enough base that they start inventing. And almost every country has gone through that path. And what has helped in that climbing those steps tends to have been uh, intellectual property. Uh, the US, we kind of followed uh, the path of the British, but we did something that was particularly unique. Um, and it's, not only is it unique, uh, but it's historic to Philadelphia. It's unique to Philadelphia. Um, when the Constitution was being debated uh, uh, a couple of blocks away from here, um, think about it, in, in, in the middle of that summer, hot, you know, steamy summer, there's, um, they're trying to create a nation, right? 1787, trying to create a nation. Uh, there's this horrible American original scene of slavery staring them in the face. Uh, they just fought the greatest superpower in the world, uh, the British Empire. Um, and there was a ragtag group of 13 individual colonies trying to create a nation. And in spite of that, in Article 1 of the Constitution, Section 8, they put in a provision for intellectual property protection. Pause. Just think about that. 
1787, guys were sitting around the table talking about intellectual property protection. In fact, there were two drafts of that provision. That's how powerful it was. And I tell my students that it's like opening the, um, the tomb of King Tut and seeing a cell phone in his bony hands. I mean, when you think about it, the bulk of the US economy today is from intellectual property. And that base was established in 1787, right here in Philadelphia, uh, in the Constitution. Um, two more comments on this question of just the conceptual framework around this. Um, you know, we live in a period right now where, where some would argue that our nation is somewhat polar, uh, polarized. And um, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, in some regards, reflects that. But there is one thing that justices, irrespective of their political orientation at the time they got appointed, um, uh, all agree on, which is the protection of intellectual property. So what started in 1787, what formed the, base, the bedrock of our economy today, that concept has seeped throughout our legal structure. And there's, a, 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 in my view, a, a, an inordinate support um, of intellectual property. Uh, I, I put up um, the Bowman uh, case and Monsanto, which is a fascinating case about seeds and, and the like. Um, I won't bore you too much with it, but it's a fascinating case. But the upshot of it was that Justice Kagan, who some would believe is on the left side of the political spectrum, um, give, gave a, uh, um, um, uh, the opinion for the court. <laughs> and I highlight uh, one, of the part, one of the core parts of the opinion, which is that um, if Bowman was granted uh, uh, an exception, and this is an exception to the um, uh, exhaustion principle, patents or sales would retain little value. So the whole point here was that the, the courts were supporting the notion that intellectual property and the protection of intellectual property is a core driver. And it's really a, an amazing way of, of looking at how we have pushed the, the concept of property. And so all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, um, Justice Kagan on, in the Bowman case, um, Justice uh, Sc um, uh, Thomas um, in the Marriott Genetics case, all of them are strong, strong supporters and advocates of the protection of intellectual property. So, intellectual property is all around us. Um, it's become so ubiquitous that many times we're not even conscious of it. Uh, it seeps into every aspect of our lives. And just to give an idea of the value proposition that it represents, um, Let's pick one of the easiest forms of intellectual property to create, which is a trademark. Um, this is, this is a, a schedule, and there's a lot of math and economics behind this in terms of how they come up with their valuation. So it's a pretty good base of it. But this is a view of the value of Google, the trademark, over 300 billion. The value of Apple, a quarter eaten Apple, by the way, um, <laughs> over 300 billion. Um, Amazon, that didn't exist you know, a couple of decades ago, over 207 billion. This is not the value of the companies. This is the value of their trademarks. So when we start talking about intellectual property being currency, you're getting a sense of the value proposition that it could, it could represent. And this is some of the easiest forms of intellectual property to create are trademarks. Okay. Um, in fact, um, uh, Two Nobel laureates, um, two of the most recent Nobel laureates, uh, they got the Nobel Prize. Uh, one of them got this Nobel Prize by, um, by focusing on the um, accumulation of ideas and how that sustains growth. In, in other words, it was focusing on the value proposition that intellectual property has to an economy. And you're getting Nobel Prizes on that now. So that kind of gives you an, an idea of how important this is. I always love cartoons because they capture a lot of thought in, in just one <laughs> short way. Um, and is this kind of where we're going? Has this become so ubiquitous now um, that um, this becomes a problem for us? Uh, if you look at it from, uh, just to give you a perspective, if you look at it in, in one way, there are arguments that approximately 25% of the human genes have been directly patented. Now, 
some recent cases, there's a question about whether those patents are valid, but the reality is that 25% of the human genes have been patented. But let me tell you what is even more remarkable. The, the DNA the delta between us and chimpanzees is approximately 2%. So we kind of share 98%, right? Well, 100% of the chimpanzee genes have been patented. Do your, do, your, do your calculation as to what that means. And what is the ramification of that? What does it mean to be human? What is you? What is truly you? And there are some interesting cases that have come up recently, um, all the way to some of the most liberal courts, uh, for instance, the California Supreme Court, uh, that have held that if something is taken out of you and in a medical procedure, and it leads to an invention uh, that is patented by a third party, um, you actually have no rights to it. So there's a host of things going on right now about the power of intellectual property, what that means, and how that is seeping into every aspect of our lives. So why should this matter to us? I mentioned earlier on that 1787 was in, uh, interesting in terms of it being the bedrock of our economy. Well, this is what that means in real terms. So in 2016, 38.2% uh, of the US GDP came from intellectual property protected assets. That is huge. That is huge. That is trillions and trillions of dollars of value. Um, so it matters to us from an economic perspective. It matters to us from a concentration perspective. I, I talked earlier on about the Bowman case um, uh, that Justice Kagan uh, ruled on. There's been a huge concentration of um, the supply of agriculture and food, not just in the US, but on a global basis. The only way that is possible is because of the power of intellectual property, because these companies have filed patents around their seeds, and those seeds are designed in a way to maximize their own economic interest. So the seeds are designed to be sterile after one planting. So the effect of that is that if you buy their seeds, you cannot do what farmers have done for eons, which is to save some of the seed to replant for the next season. If you plant their seeds, you get a really great harvest because they've genetically modified the seeds to be more hardy. But you have to go back to them <laughs> to buy seeds for the next season. So relatively small number of companies control the bulk of our food supply. That's possible because of intellectual property. Um, it matters to us as human beings. Earlier on, I asked the question, what does it mean to be human? And we can talk ad nauseum about that. But more importantly, what does it mean to talk about a lifetime? How long is your life? What is your average lifespan? And how much of that is affected by intellectual property? I would tell you a large percentage of it. So whether you live to be a healthy, active 100 years old or not could depend on who you decide to pay from an intellectual property perspective. So it matters as to what it means to be human and our life extension. And it, all this also matters as to strategically, if intellectual property is the new global currency, then guess what? We need to start thinking, we need to think even more about how do we arrange our affairs, our economy, what do we invest in? What must we do to be able to be competitive or build massive mints if this is the new global currency? How do you create this new global currency? And that has a huge impact on policy and the government. So there are four major ways that this issue matters. I'm just gonna flick through these slides. Here's the point here. There's a tremendous amount of work that is being done um, about tracking w where countries are on a competitive basis. And just get a sense of this. I'm just gonna point out the sense of, of where we are here. Does this thing have a pointer? I don't think it does. Oh, can you see the pointer? No, you can't. Okay, so the top, the top line is the US. So that's good for us, right? So when it comes to um, high tech manufacturing industries, we are number one. Right, so the top line is uh, the US. Can anyone guess what the second line right behind us that is pointing north? 
Oh, China. Yeah. Yeah. China. Right up our tail. Okay. Um, this is looking at service industry, so the service side of tech. Again, the top line is the US, we're doing well. Um, but can anyone guess that fourth line that is pointing north? Oh, China. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right up our tail. Um, this is looking at the mid level high tech industries. Wait a minute. What's that top line? They're beating our tail. This is real. This is today. This is happening. Okay? If you are growing on the mid level uh, tech industries, what do you think is going to happen when that growth gets to a point where you now become high tech? So it is this slide that is animating this slide. This is real. This is happening right now. Okay? So, here's another way of thinking about intellectual property. Look at the S&P 500, and you look at the, the top companies there, and you look at what is their value between their tangible assets and their intangible assets. <laughs> look at the graph. Over 80% of all these companies on the S&P 500 their real value is intellectual property. So if you think you own stocks in, pick any company you want, and you think you actually own stock in a physical company, forget it. Your real value is the IP that that, country, that company has. This is reality. And most of us are not even conscious of this. Look at a couple of companies. This is their balance sheet. Again, you see the huge differential. The orange at the bottom is their physical assets. The rest is intangibles. <laughs> the rest is intellectual property. This is what is animating our economy today. I mentioned the seed, why this mattered earlier on. So think about it. Right now, four companies, only four companies, control 60% of all seeds that are in commercial production. In some instances, they actually control the bulk of the food in a given country. I didn't say in terms of business, I'm saying the whole country. Um, four companies control 80% of all corn. Four com com uh, companies control 70% of all soy. This is not possible without the power of intellectual property. What is important about this is just to give you a sense that really only 10 companies <laughs> control most of the consumer brands that you buy. Only 10 companies. All those brands. Again, this is not possible without the power of intellectual property. This has become such a ubiquitous part of our economy that started in 1787, and we were just not conscious of it. All right, so what does this mean from a life sciences perspective, where I spend a lot of my time? Back to my good friend, uh, uh, Yaval Harari, um, uh, in his second book. Um, and I love the quote, that medicine is undergoing a tremendous conceptual revolution. 20th century medicine aimed to heal the sick. 21st century medicine is increasingly aimed to upgrade the healthy. What does that mean? And it talks about it as a conceptual um, revolution. Well, uh, what that kind of means is where we put our resources, what we decide to research, what we decide to create, uh, is shifting. And because we've dealt with a lot of the low-hanging fruits in terms of the amazing things that vaccines can do, <laughs> the amazing things that basic med med medicines uh, can do. Now, we're taking the healthy and we're upgrading them. What does that mean? There's a, a, a program out at Penn right now where a company, it's a startup company, they're, they're in the J-Corp, uh, there's a J&J &J, um, uh, incubator that has been, the first one was set up at Penn, we're very proud of that. And what they're interested in is ostensibly uh, developing brain implants to help 
um, um, people who have PTSD or people who have been severely injured, ostensibly. That is, and they've gotten a lot of money from the government doing that. But what I love about it is it's a little subtext if you look at the materials very well. And their aim, uh, look at the bottom line there, is to be used to improve memory in healthy human beings. Pause. Think about it. We're in an academic situation right here. So let's say I have a, a brain implant, and I've got 10 students in my class. Three of them have brain implants, and their brain implants allows them to store memory. It's like a hard drive. And the other seven don't. Great competition in class, right? I'm going to have a closed book exam, and they're going to compete together. Really? Really? I mean, this is happening now. It's not a theoretical issue anymore. We're enhancing human beings. And um, what does that mean to our society? What does it mean to be human? Uh, how should we deal with that? Um, talk about life extension. Forget getting your head frozen in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a vat somewhere in Arizona. Um, <laughs> some people. Um, <laughs> there are others who are actually approaching it in a slightly different way. And uh, Cynthia Canyon happens to be one of them. And she was working with some interest in um, 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 worms and noticed that she could tweak certain cells and extend their lifespan. Um, so um, this became a very interesting play. Um, you know, she kind of looked at worms and then she looked at uh, mole rats and noticed that they live 30 years uh, and, you know, other rats, um, other mouse uh, uh, live a much shorter period of time. So she's now part of a company called Calico. Now, again, let's pause for a moment and think about this. Calico is a, is a private company, a joint venture uh, of AbbVie and Alphabet. They initially put in $1.5 billion, so 750 million each. They've upped that now to $3 billion. So you have a private company that is funded to the tune of $3 billion. And what is the objective? Oh, to deal with this disease called aging. Interesting. Fundamentally conceptual shift, which is what Harari was talking about. They, they, they've decided to characterize aging as a disease and to approach it in that, in that way. They've got a ton of money. It's allowed them to recruit some of the brightest minds working in this space. And they're off to the races. And if they want, once in a while, they kind of tell us what they're doing. But more often than not, they don't. So let's presume that they're remotely successful, just tiny. In the US, uh, um, I, uh, by the way, before I make this comment, I always joke the most dangerous word in the English language is the word average, because it's meaningless, and most people don't even know how to calculate it. Um, but in the US, the average lifespan for a man right now is like 78 years old. Uh, we're kind of silly. We kill ourselves. We do really silly things, so we die early. And, and for a woman, it's around 79. That average shifts dramatically depending on your zip code. Uh, you can actually go online and check it out. It's a lot of fun to, to see what the average, how it shifts. I think the lowest zip code is somewhere in Louisiana, and 66 is the average lifespan. But if you could move that average, if you could move that to a healthy 90, a healthy 100, what does that mean to us? What, what does a career mean? <laughs> what does marriage mean? 60-year marriage? Really? OK, interesting. OK? So fundamental shifts in society um, are going to occur. What does a career mean? Are you going to be, what, a doctor for 60 years? Still healthy? A lawyer for 60 years? Or are you going to go through three or four or five professions? But also, what does it mean in terms of the way we approach things? So increasingly, individuals with a lot of money who are relatively young have decided that, wait a minute, uh, I like my money. I like to spend it for a long time, for a much longer time. Why should I agree to age and die? Ah, how much will it cost me? So you're seeing all kinds of folks funding uh, this research. 
And then what does that mean to society? If we actually improve on the average lifespan, if we do it on a fundamental basis, not just the question of your food and your exercise and all that, but if we do it on a fundamental basis based on genes or tweaking or something fundamental like that, um, you think the first guy that's going to get it is the guy walking on the streets of Philadelphia? Really? Are we leading ourselves to a point where we bifurcate society altogether? Will it lead to a question of what does it mean to be human? We will have a homo sapiens sapien. And if we, can, if we do get that, what does that mean to our society? What does it mean to the stability? What does it mean to the economy? These are issues that are going on right now, but because intellectual property has become such a powerful part of our paradigm, we are not debating these issues. We are not engaging in discussion on these issues. We're all very happy for intellectual property. We've been deeply socialized to believe it's a fantastic thing. It is. I make a living from it. I love it. But I do think we need to start asking ourselves these hard questions. And this needs to be a, a more open and intense discussion than what we've had to date. Uh, this kind of tells you where I spend a lot of time eating. It's a Chinese uh, fortune cookie. Um, and I love it because it kind of captures the need for us to reflect, right? Um, so, I mentioned earlier on about it being a new global currency and I talked about building the means. Um, important thing here is everyone is working on this. So please, we should not delude ourselves <laughs> that uh, we are number one, um, um, because unfortunately the people that we think are number two or three, uh, they actually don't believe us. They think they're number one too. <laughs> and they're kind of walking towards that. So it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, the Chinese, for example, are talking about uh, making a commitment that they want to be the number one in AI. Well, the interesting thing about directed capitalism, which is what the Chinese model is becoming, is, is you know, conceptually that was not supposed to be possible, but that's kind of what we're dealing with now, with directed capitalism. Um, they not only talk about it, they have the ability to do something about it, like $150 billion being put to back AI at a time where we are moving into an anti intelligentsia environment in our country. <laughs> it's the most bizarre thing. If intellectual property is the new global currency, if this is what is driving the economy, if this is what is animating the global economy, then what the heck are we doing? If you're going to have this new currency, then you have to have a mint. And the mint that creates it is the brilliance of everyone in this room. And if we can figure out how to build that mint, we're going to lose out. Uh, $150 billion by the Chinese behind AI in a directed capitalist environment is something um, to take very seriously. It is not a strategy to say that your opponent is going to fail. That is not a strategy. They may fail. Fine. That's icing on the cake. It cannot be the cake. We need to take this seriously. Um, intellectual property is becoming a multipolar reality. Everyone is on this. Um, so let me tell you, I, I brought up the Chinese a couple of times because people can focus on it and they've kind of been in the news recently. Right? And there's so much hype in the news, people are not really understanding what is going on. So I thought this would be helpful just to capture some of the quote unquote, and I love that word, surprising. It's only surprising because we are so deeply socialized. <laughs> That's the only reason why it's surprising. All right? And the deep socialization is that we are number one and everyone else is number two. So let's talk about what is surprising. The Chinese in 2015, oh, by the way, people usually say to me, wait a minute, you're in the world of intellectual property. The Chinese, are, they're horrible on intellectual property. And I burst out laughing. I said, really? Uh, in 1623, 1624, England was protecting people who stole technology. America, we did the same thing. Every industrialized country has done that. But remember what I said, they steal it first, then they copy, then they modify, then they start inventing. When the traditional concept of an inventor and the protection 
of intellectual property that the inventor creates, when that is the biggest boost to your economy, is when you are inventing. It's actually a negative to your economy if you have it when you are still in the stealing and building phase, because it limits your ability to do that. So, um, what is fascinating about China is that they actually have some of the best IP laws in the world. Let me repeat that. I know it sounds strange. They actually have some of the best IP laws in the world. You know what they did? To comply with the uh, TRIPS agreements so that they could join the WTO, they actually wrote some very good IP laws. They simply decided not to enforce them. <laughs> so the laws are really good. It's just that they didn't enforce them until now. Because guess what? They've started to invent. So now they have an economic interest. The guys who are inventing want those wonderful laws to protect their IP because they make money out of it. Why should they be using it to protect a foreigner's IP? So a million patents were filed in China in 2015. That is double the number of patents that we filed in the US. This is a reality, this is happening, and this is happening now. The, the, the volume, yes, adjusts for the population, but you also then have to adjust for the economic uh, level, the educational level, and the like. And all of a sudden, their population is not so much as a big advantage vis-a-vis -vis us. <laughs> In addition, what is particularly bizarre is China is becoming a venue that non-Chinese companies go to fight for IP, to have IP litigation. You know why? Uh, they have really good IP laws. And there is a belief and a trust that is being developed that they are even-handed in their court adjudication when the two parties are non-Chinese. So all of a sudden, China is becoming a venue for IP litigation? What happened to good old United States? As I said, this is ostensibly um, um, surprising. And if you look at uh, the last bullet point there, uh, when it's between non-Chinese, the foreign, 65 foreign parent plaintiffs won all of their cases. Does anybody know what this is? Anyone knows this story? Yeah. Okay. I love the story, by the way. I think it's really crazy. So Macau monkey, minding his own business in the forest, a famous photographer, now even more famous, leaves a camera in the forest. Macau monkey goes and takes a selfie. The photographer comes, collects his equipment, does a wonderful uh, uh, um, coffee book of pictures of the Macau monkey and a whole bunch of other creatures that took selfies. Uh, our friends in Peter decided they're going to sue, sue the photographer on behalf of the Macau monkey. <laughs> you chuckle, eh? You chuckle. I'm telling you, this was a lawsuit. And the basis of the lawsuit was that the photographer um, did not own the copyright to the, to the selfie. After all, it was the Bacau monkey that took the picture. And this was a lawsuit. You, all of us here paid for it because we paid taxes to maintain the court system. And this was a lawsuit that went through the, the, the court system. Of course, there's a question of how does Peter, did they get the consent of the Macau monkey to represent them and so on and so forth. But the bottom, the bottom line is this. <laughs> Here we are in the 21st century using 17th century concepts to try to manage intellectual property when we're talking about 21st century technology. Does this make sense? Don't we need to revisit and rethink this? I love the Macau comment. So, what is the option? Intellectual property and the value it creates has become, in my view, the new global currency. Um, it is crucial for everything we do, from our business to our health to our social interactions. 
Um, it, it, it could even end up defining or getting us to ask the question of what it means to be human. Um, we need to start thinking seriously about the ethical and moral issues here. We need to ask ourselves, are there lines? Are there things that should not be susceptible to ownership? If I engineer a sentient being, do I own it? Should I own it? Does it raise issues about the 13th and 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution that outlawed slavery? I don't know. But what we at least must do is engage in this discussion and on, also understand that we're not the only ones at the table. Uh, it's become a multipolar world when it comes to IP. And if we intend to become number one, let me rephrase that, some will say if we intend to stay number one, um, we need to really take this very seriously. I think I've bored you enough. Well, for those of you who have participated in these, uh, in these events before, I think, it would, I think you would probably agree. This is far and away the most intriguing and provocative of presentations that we've had so far. And I think a lot of that comes from the intellectual curiosity with which you approach your work, your life, and the world as you see it. Um, I'm sure there are questions. I know there are a lot of intellectual property interests being represented here. You want to start, Rose? I'll just kick us off. Um, so is this topic that you raise being, I mean, do you hear people talking about this? Is there a venue? Is there, uh, it, this is an interesting thought that I haven't really uh, seen people talking about. Um, in academia, there are uh, ethic ethicists who are now debating some of these issues. Uh, but they're talking to each other. <laughs> and people are writing interesting papers. Uh, but my point is um, we need to engage the whole, the whole of our community on, in these discussions. I think it's just too important for us to be having internal uh, discussions about it. Um, the other point in the issue is uh, what do you do about this? How do you actually do this? We, <laughs> some of the leading um, uh, SpaceX <laughs> remote controlled a private spacecraft to lock, to dock at the International Space, uh, Space Station last week. Private, non-governmental. <laughs> so there's a real question of how do, what should we do? How should we manage this? How do we get ahead of this? But that debate, in my view, cannot be left to just an academic debate. It needs to be a broader uh, societal debate. So, so that's the answer. It has been discussed within academia. I'm going to do one more. So just to take a step back from the far, far, far out that you've taken us to, one of the interesting conversations, I think, within academic health systems now is we have patent policies that cover patentable stuff. So if an academic researcher from our academic side of the house um, create some invention and we patent it in their named inventor, there's a policy by which they share in the revenues. Um, but another huge thing that's happening in academic health systems is that the clinical enterprise is becoming the center of innovation. And there are processes and products that are arising out of the clinical enterprise that are harder to pin a, who, who are the innovators? How many people over time have helped to create this thing that is allowing us to start a new product? Um, and it's an active um, conversation. Um, at the moment, in those cases, there is no direct payment back to individuals like there is in the, in the academic side. There's instead incentivizations to those departments and to those divisions that create it. Um, I'm wondering if that's something you've seen people handle in different and interesting ways that you might share with us. Uh, there are parallels. There are parallels. And the parallels are, are, are somewhat very broad. So for example, on the question of who's the inventor. Um, part of the, that's part of the debate when it comes to indigenous knowledge. Okay, <laughs> If a community, uh, an indigenous community in the Amazon has a particular plant or a particular um, a natural product that they've used to uh, treat a certain uh, health condition over eons, uh, who owns it? Um, Th that is part of the question that I asked with the Macau uh, uh, monkey uh, selfie, which is, 
we're using 17th, 18th, 19th century concepts to deal with 21st century reality. And we start up a pattern system that requires you to have an inventor. Really? Nowadays, with the level of collaboration? And if you remember, the original definition of an inventor under the English system included someone who stole the technology and smuggled it into England. <laughs> so maybe we need to revisit that as <laughs> what it means to be an inventor. So yes, the, 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 uh, these issues are being discussed, um, but they're not easy. And, and, and I think that policy uh, discussions from an academic perspective uh, in terms of how do you incentivize people uh, to, to add uh, to, the, to the knowledge and, uh, and to the good of society while still being uh, faithful to the academic interest, uh, I think that's the kind of thing that they pay you the big bucks to figure out. We have a question here. Um, yeah, I take your uh, comment of IP as a new currency, uh, you know, seriously. But if you consider Theranos, where the IP basically provided the basis for a Ponzi scheme, mm -hmm. Um, how, I mean, with currency we have the U.S. Mint, which at least you have a dollar you think came from someplace that <laughs> wasn't a copy machine. Um, what today is the overriding basis for creating value and validating that currency? Um, great question. Remember two things. Number one, I started off by saying we made this thing up. And, and so, <laughs> intangible property does not exist outside of the law. It's a total creation of the law. So the ultimate arbiter is the court system. A patent, any form of intangible property is presumed valid until proven otherwise. And the way you prove it otherwise is by going to court. That's the ultimate arbiter. Um, and, and that will continue to be the ultimate arbiter for as long as it's something that we made up. <laughs> you know, um, that's, that actually is a good comment because it, it brings into sharp focus the nature of intellectual property. So a choke, a, a, you know, a, a throat choke is very useful if we're fighting over this. But how do you do that to the guy in China who just knocked off the Nike switch mark? A little bit harder to do. How do you do that for the millions of people throughout the world who just knocked up another drug? Ah, a little bit harder to do. So that is the difference between intellectual property and physical property. Choke, you know, throat chokes work very well for this. They don't, they, <laughs> drones. <laughs> well, that becomes a challenge also. We have another question here. Hi, my name is Regina. I'm the uh, founder of Utopia Health Design. I actually had a manufacturer from China um, inquire about a patent that I have that's pending. And my patent lawyer said, proceed at your own risk. Mm -hmm. um, from a takeaway from this lecture, you're encouraging a, getting a patent lawyer through China or there are law firms here for international patents. You're encouraging proceeding with getting a patent in China? So uh, your question actually has three elements to it. So let me start off with the easiest one. <laughs> My main takeaway is to say intellectual property is very important. It's animating our economy. But we are not the only ones in the game. So that's the first big takeaway. Second big, big takeaway is there's this idea that China is this you know, you know, the devil with the horns and the tails and the hoops and the like. Uh, but there's nothing that they're doing that we didn't do. Nothing. They learned from us. In fact, one of the most interesting things that was stolen from China was how to make silk. The British did that. And then protected it in England. So there's nothing that they're doing that we didn't do. The third takeaway is um, people act in their own economic interest. So if you have something that we made up called intellectual property that creates wealth and value for people, well, guess when people would be most interested in protecting it? When they themselves are creating intellectual property that is susceptible to protection. So I'm saying we shouldn't be deluded about what is going on in China. China is taking intellectual property very seriously. 
Yes, they stole. Some would claim that they're still stealing, doing exactly what we did. Yeah, but they are actually created, they've actually created very interesting teacher property protection within China, and now they've started to enforce it. So to your question of whether or not you should get a patent in China, I would say, yeah, if you could, because it's an important economy, and it's going to become an even more important economy. And what is going to animate that economy, the way it's animating our economy, is going to be intellectual property. So if you can get protection there, why shouldn't you? We have another one, another question here, Osagi. Yeah. Hi, so I uh, interpreted your talk as uh, putting forward sort of two ideas, one about a national competitiveness in developing IP, and another the sort of moral question as to, as um, technology advances uh, and as it interact, interacts with intellectual property law, it creates some moral and ethical quandaries. So you as somebody from private capital, what do you see as your role as a person from private capital in addressing these, maybe these questions of national competitiveness and the ethical and moral questions that arise from new technologies and intellectual property? Um, two things. Uh, the first one, from a private equity you know, uh, perspective as an investor, um, we are ecstatic to um, support and invest in really cool technology. Um, there's, a, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done from a concept to an academic to a commercialization opportunity. And those transitions are very challenging and you need a set of interesting skill sets, including how to build a business, how to commercialize, what is important and, and the like. So that's the way we're engaging in this space and that's what we love to do. Um, on the moral questions, um, I think the first way you start dealing with moral questions is to acknowledge that there's a moral question in the first place. Part of my discomfort is that so many of our friends and so many people are not even acknowledging that there's a moral question. I mean, we, we have not drawn the line as to what is susceptible to ownership. Uh, in America, you could own a river. You can own air. Are those, moral, are, those, are those lines real? Should we ask ourselves whether that is something that is susceptible to ownership? And right now, based on the Chakrabarti case, which was what led to the birth, mark, uh, the, the birth of the biotech industry, I can, unless the law changes, I don't see any limits on what you can actually patent on a biological basis. So my point is that there are deep moral issues. When we make investments, that is top of mind for us. So we draw our own lines. But I don't think it's good enough for one firm to be doing that. Uh, I think we need to have a broader discussion about where those lines should be drawn. And the problem is that the science is moving faster than our law. The science is moving faster than our discussions, our social discussions about what we should be doing. I think, that's, I think that's uncomfortable. My colleague, Heather Rose, has a question. I, great speech. I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think in regards to the gene patents, there's an important lesson on both sides. I agree that it was getting into weird territory that genes were being owned. Um, although, I will add, they're products of nature, just like salicylic acid, which is aspirin, just like all the vitamins, many of which have been patented, because their value to humans didn't become apparent until we were able to actually synthesize them, until we were able to actually put them into a product. In the case of the Myriad Mayo BRCA1-2 gene case, it was being used in a diagnostic that had been developed for a long time mm -hmm. by Myriad mm -hmm. into a product that was an assay, and they had identified the biomarker. I saw huge change after Myriad Mayo and then Prometheus came mm -hmm. down in willingness to invest and develop biomarkers. And I think at, at that point, the United States was just about to become a world leader in precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And it stopped completely because of the, the fact that biomarkers were no longer patentable. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was a huge loss mm -hmm. to 
patients and humans who could have benefited from us identifying biomarkers from Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. which will now probably not be developed because they're not mm -hmm. patentable. Mm -hmm. So I do think, I wish in that case, that the court had actually dusted off the usefulness clause mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not ever been used as far as I know and mm -hmm. whenever I reach out to other patent attorneys, nobody's seen it. Because for something to be patentable, it has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. Mm -hmm. And I believe it is not useful to know the sequence of a gene and not know what it does. But it's never been used usefulness. Mm -hmm. Well, it was used during prohibition. Mm -hmm. But it stopped being used after that. It was used for moral reasons. Mm -hmm. So in any event, I just say that I, I really do think that there was, I get it that there was a loss from a patent standpoint, but I think there was a huge loss from a scientific and, and um, human health standpoint as well. Okay. Um, the beauty about intellectual property is that it's an extraordinarily exciting field, right? I keep on going back to the fundamental issues. We made it up, and it creates value. I'm supportive of both, all right? Um, so on the Myriad one, let me just put it in, let me, let me ask you an interesting question. What if, instead of filing a patent on their observation on BRCA1 and 2, uh, the mutations and the, the way it directs the path of the disease, whether it's more aggressive or less aggressive. What if Myriad had kept it as a trade secret? What if Myriad had simply said, we figured out a way to predict the path of your disease. We have a black box. Hey, we're going to do some testing. We're going to give us a bunch of samples. You know the, you know, blinded. We're going to run it through our black box. We're going to give you back a, a, an application, right? And we're never going to tell you how we do it. My very point. My, my very point. Yeah. Except if someone is able to reverse engineer it or someone discovers it independently. So at the beginning of my presentation, I talked through the species of intellectual property, and I went through that very, uh, very uh, quickly. But the best trade secret commercially in the world is the formula for Coca-Cola. <laughs> if they had filed a patent on it, everyone could have made Coke by now. Right? But it's been there for over a century because they kept it as a trade secret. And I joke, most people miss this. You go throughout the world and you see a Coca-Cola factory, and it's a Coca-Cola something factory. What is that something? Most people miss it. Yawa. <laughs> Coca-Cola bottling factory. And the reason it's the bottling factory is that the, the syrups come from only one place, Atlanta, Georgia. So all the Coke in this world you just get the syrup, you put in carbonated water, and you bottle it. So yes, will, will, will we see shifts? Of course we will. Uh, but that's the nature of intellectual property. That's the nature of what we created. Right? And, um, and I am, I am, my point is to raise these issues so that we can have a broader societal discussion about it. Um, I can tell you my own views on, on, on every single one of them, but that would take, that would take <laughs> way too long. So with an eye toward time, I think we have time for one last question. Great, yeah, great, great presentation. So um, it seems that there's a balance between a patent as a way to encourage innovation and a patent that also can stifle innovation if it, if it protects a very broad area of, of intellectual property. So how do we strike the balance, especially in view of the, the pace of innovation is increasing? Should we be slowly dialing back the number of years of protection that people get under patents over time? Because um, we would be encouraging more innovation. How do we find the right balance between time and, and protection? Excellent, excellent question. And I would just make one clarification to your question before I, before I give my, uh, my views. Uh, the first, uh, and the clarification is, yes, there is, there's, a dif there's a difference between patents Patents could stifle innovation, and they could encourage innovation. Um, but it's, it's not just the scope and the duration. It's also the time in which your society has patent protection. If an economy is in the steal, copy, make phase, then if you have strong patent protection, you completely stifle that economy. So I'll give you hard empirical evidence on that. Less than 2% of all the patents on the continent of Africa are owned by Africans. 
Why? How, how do you have a situation where 98% of the patents are owned by foreigners? Because they signed on, these countries all signed on <laughs> to intellectual property protection <laughs> um, too early in their lives. So they never had the opportunity to do what England did and what we did, which is to steal and then copy <laughs> and start tweaking and then invent. So once you are inventing, absolutely you want patents. That's what we're saying with China. China is now starting to enforce its patent law because they are inventing. And if they're inventing, then it makes economic sense for them to protect their own economic interest. So patents are not always good. It really does depend on where it falls within your uh, economic uh, pro uh, uh, state. And to your question as to how do we fine tune that, uh, that's what really smart economists and really smart policy makers should be wrestling with. Right now, I think that the biggest issue from my perspective is actually the duration of patents, right? So patents are now 20 years for all forms of patents. Really? Um, trademark is for as long, it's forever, as long as you prevent it from becoming generic. Copyrights are for the life of the author plus 70 years in the case of the US. So uh, Presley has made more money since he died than he ever made while he was alive. Okay? Does that really make sense? Sh should we be thinking about it along those lines? And if you protect things through trade secret or through copyright, that can be a much longer period of time than your patents. And now, America and Japan, we actually allow um, a, a, a copyright protection for some forms of software. Really? So th these are huge policy issues that we should be wrestling. And we need to really determine whether or not um, what is the best thing for the economy and what is the best thing for uh, spurring innovation. Please join me in thanking our guests and go forth and create. <laughs>